On that note, if you have your Bibles with you, please open them to the book of Acts and chapter 2 where we've been for the previous four Sundays. Today we conclude our refocus series, uh, and we're going to be looking at, of course, uh, the subject of the prayers. We've looked at the first few uh, uh, acts of worship that the early church devoted themselves to on a continual basis. Uh, We'll look at that a little bit more today, but we're going to focus on the last of those four acts of worship probably one of the most important ones, if not the most important one, the prayers. I emphasize the plural aspect of that. I want to read for us one more time our full text that we've been looking at in this series, Acts 2, 42 to 47, and then I will pray one more time. So read along with me if you would. We'll just put the first verse on screen uh, as our focus for today. Read with me. And they, those who professed faith in Jesus Christ on that day of Pentecost, four to five, maybe 6,000 at one time, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing proceeds to all as any had need, and day by day, attending the temple temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. Let's pray. Our Father, our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what uh, you have done, what you and the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit have uh, purposed together to accomplish on our behalf. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you for coming. We thank you for dying for us. We thank you for living the life, first of all, that we cannot live, but living it for us and showing us the way. We thank you especially, though, for dying on the cross for us. We thank you, Jesus and Heavenly Father, for sending us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. And so, Holy Spirit, we look to you today. I look to you today um, in weakness, honestly. Um, We ask that you will open up this passage, this important part of our series today that we conclude with, the prayers. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us, really speak to us all of us. And I pray these things in Jesus' worthy name. Amen. So as I was preparing to conclude this series, uh, I felt a little bit overwhelmed a few times this week, just just thinking of the the broad, amazing concepts that have uh, been refreshed in my mind, I hope in yours as well, as part of a refocus. And again, it's amazing to me. It's always amazing to me. Uh, Every time you go back to Scripture, a passage that I've read this so many times, we planted this church by looking at this passage and text. And yet, when we go back to it prayerfully and openly and ask the Holy Spirit to show us afresh, He does. And so, I don't know about you, but uh, the the whole idea, it's just been a thread through it, uh, even from the first week, but especially, obviously, in the second, when we looked at the fellowship the koinonia, this amazing unity and oneness that they possessed in that day. And I certainly hope that all of us have have developed in our hearts a true longing for that and no longer a doubt in our minds that we cannot be perfectly one. Jesus is praying for that right now. He's praying for that. So they had this oneness in the Word. They had oneness in, yes, doctrine and theology. They had this material oneness, whether it was food, property, or even, yes, their money. They shared everything. They had that koinonia, which literally is holding all things in common. They shared, of course, and held in common the breaking of bread, sitting around the table and celebrating the body and blood of Christ, remembering the cross and examining themselves, and therefore repenting as soon as they looked at themselves in comparison to Him and to that and to the forgiveness that we were given that we don't deserve, yes, 
repentance, and through that, sanctification and health in the local church. And so today, prayer, which I, I hope will show us one more important way in which they were fully united and one, the mission. From the apostles out, they were all dedicated and devoted to the mission. So we've learned that the birth of the church and their devotion to uh, all of the four acts of worship to one another and the Lord were the result of two things, the power of the Holy Spirit that came upon them all on the day of Pentecost and filled them all. And secondly, it was an answer to prayer. And of course, it was an answer to the prayer of Jesus. I want to revisit those words with you one more time today because it's again so appropriate to what we're looking at today. You'll remember John 17 where Jesus uh, he prays what's called the high priestly prayer. He's praying from the beginning verse all the way down, and we get to verse 20, and He says this at this point to His heavenly Father. He says, I do not, not ask for these only, my, my apostles here and these disciples who are following Me, but also for those who will believe in Me through their word, through their proclamation and teaching, that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may really believe that you have sent me. The glory, oh, we've been singing about that this morning, that you have given to me, I have given to them, that, you may be, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, and here it is, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Now, please imagine that. Please take that to heart. Our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father loves us no less, no more, exactly the same way that He loves the Son. Do you believe that? Do you trust that? Let's do that. So we see here in this prayer, as we've seen so far a few times, that it is their unity, their devotion to one another on display publicly that is their primary form of evangelism. The people in the city of Jerusalem and wherever they would go from that point on are seeing their devotion, yes, to, to the, the religious practices, to the four acts of worship, but to one another, a, an unbelievable love of the other and one another, as commanded by Jesus. It's one thing for Him to command it, but for, to it, for it to be embodied is beautiful. And that's exactly what we've seen. I believe we've also seen, however, that there are a few other or more ways in which they, their way of life spoke the gospel loudly in their world and culture. To, to everyone who knew them personally, most of them initially were Jewish men and women who were known in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. To everyone who knew them, it was obvious and apparent they had changed, completely changed. They weren't the same people. Plus, they constantly now desired to be with this new group of people, these people who now believed in the risen Jesus Christ, more than anyone else, even their own family, their blood family, their flesh and blood family. But they also talked about this Jesus, about what He did and accomplished on their behalf, about Him being the true Messiah all the time, constantly. They spoke about His life, His death, His burial, His res resurrection, constantly. That was their conversation, and that also was their witness. And when they had these, quote, breaking of bread services, gatherings, they not only focused all of their thoughts, of course, and words on the cross and ate what they claimed represented the body and blood of Jesus Christ, given for, as an atoning sacrifice, and listen, for their sins, as we saw last week, once and for all, they witnessed to that. And that, too, was part of their evangelism. 
They also, listen, we saw this last week, witnessed not only to their firm belief that He lived, that He died, and that He rose, but they are continuing to practice, particularly the breaking of bread, to proclaim, we know He's coming back. He's coming again. And so all this, all of these acts of worship that they were continually devoting themselves to demonstrated their unity and oneness. There wasn't one aspect that they were not unified in. They held to these things beautifully. And of course, as we've seen, it was the result of prayer. Of course, they knew that, and that is why they continually devoted themselves to the prayers that we look at today. So three points for you today that I hope to show us is, first of all, is the focus of prayer. Secondly, Jesus' focus of prayer. And finally, the ultimate goal of prayer. So number one, the focus of prayer. And I feel it would be a good question, a fair question to ask everyone in this room and you watching online this morning, uh, this question, how's your prayer life? It's a fair question, right? Uh, I think it is. I mean, I mean, it sounds right. It sounds like a question we should be asking each other. I've been asked that question many times. In our C2C uh, church planning network, you know, we have coaches and mentors uh, discipling us and Oftentimes, when I'm talking to one of the men who's discipling me, they'll ask me, how's your prayer life? It, it's, a, it's a common question. It's a good question. You, we should all have, listen, a prayer life or have, a prayer, uh, or have prayer be a significant part of our lives. Now, listen, I'm thinking the question, however, as soon as you hear it, and the wording might be a bit of a challenge to some of us because we, we might take, when someone asks that question, it might take us back a little bit and it might be like we're calling into question how often you actually pray. And come on, let's just be honest here. Okay, I will. I'll go first. Um, the answer to that question usually is, and, and it, it, it sticks you right away as soon as someone asks you that question, is, well, you know what? Um, yeah. Not often enough, Honestly. Not often enough, especially in these days, th- these days, which is crazy. And maybe, and maybe, of course, only when there's a crisis or, or a crisis in the life of someone else that we love. But there's another potential problem with that question as I thought about it this week. I might suggest to you. And here's the problem. It's the word your. I'm, I'm reading such a, a great book right now, a really amazing book right now. I'm actually, since I am going to be taking some time to rest and restore, I'm going to maybe have to put this book aside because it's deep, it's dense, and every time I read or hear another chapter of this book, all I want to do is make notes and go, got to preach that, got to talk about that, because it's an amazing book. It, it, the author uh, has probably the deepest insights that I have read to this day, and any of you who know me, you know I read about these things all the time, about the current culture, and specifically, how did we get here? How did we arrive at a point in history, and I won't get at all the details and the, some of the things that he gets into in this book, I'll just tell you about it and you should read it, uh, but how did we get to a point in this world today where people are believing things that are true, apparently true, relatively anyway, that are not? How did we get here? It's an amazing book. The book is titled, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, and it's written by a man by the name of Carl R. Truman. So as I said, I won't take you deep into the the depths of this book this morning, but I just want to make uh, two comments. First, if you want to know, Christian, if you want to know and understand what is really going on in our world and culture today, especially parents, you need to read this book. I've recommended books by other authors for the past 10 years, and every time I ask, have you read Total Truth by Nancy Piercy? People go, oh, no. It's 10 years ago. It's a phenomenal book. This is a book that you need to read. Do you fear the current cultural situation? You need to read this book. The other is this. I predict this book will become, I already know this to be the case, it'll become the book that is on every pastor, ministry, leader's bookshelf for the next three to five years. It's just that strong and powerful. And of course, It's also, I'm sharing with you this morning, because of the words that I find in the title. Now, Truman, he's a British theologian and a professor of historical theology and church history at Westminster Theological Seminary. 
And he takes the, lead, the, the readers through the historical process and narrative that has taken us, listen, from a community of men and women who at one time anyway held to a collective, a common belief and sacred order of life and society to today and the modern self. The radical individualist and individualism that, listen, we're all swimming in. I can't tell you how many times I've gone on my little golf course walk and all of a sudden I'm going, yeah, that's what those people in the culture are like, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden, thunk, he hits me. And I realize I'm also uh, one of those frogs in the slowly warming pot of our culture. So why do I highlight this? Just to be relevant? Yes and no. No, because the primary problem with this question I ask, and we all accept, is not that we shouldn't, listen, have a personal prayer life. But what we see in Scripture is most often, and especially in the New Testament and in Acts 2, 42 to 47, it is a collective corporate prayer life. It's about fellowship and koinonia in prayer. It's about praying together often in unity and purpose and with perseverance. So I want to take you on a little bit of a history, similar to the man's book but different, uh, related to prayer um, and the focus of prayer in the Old Testament. We'll start there. Of course, we should. And as we do, let me, let me give away, first of all, the answer to the most important question on the table at the moment, I guess, for us today, which is this. What exactly is the focus of prayer? What should it be? Well, the answer is, whether in the Old Testament or the New, I'll put it on screen for you, the answer is, prayer is the act of asking God to do what He has already promised to do. Did you, did you know that? That's... That's exactly the focus of prayer. That's what it's always been. Now, think about it. As I've said, have you, have we always approached prayer with that perspective in mind? You know, you know what it's normally like, right? Uh, you see prayers listed in our e-newsletter or even in our missional community groups. We, people, we, we take a list at the end of our, our, our study and uh, people that pray, pray this, pray this. And, you know, we've had people in our missional community groups, they, they make a list, right? And it ends up becoming a laundry list of things. And we hope that everybody or somebody will pray for some of those things that are on the list while we're praying. You know, about our specific needs, whether health, protection, deliverance, material needs of a job or a home. Listen, these are all good and necessary but what is, where is our focus? Is, is, is it on God and His will and His kingdom or self? The focus I'm talking about. So in the Old Testament, as far back as Genesis 4.26, we read and hear the people calling out, call upon the name of the Lord. People are calling out early in chapter 4 of Genesis. For what? What are they calling out for? Um, uh, help with their sin, which has gotten to them where the place they're at? Y yeah, maybe, but, or their, their needs, their physical needs for food, for protection from animals and, and, and predators? Actually, what we see them praying about is they're calling out to God to keep His promise. What promise? The promise he made in Genesis 3.15 that he would send someone, the son of a woman, to rescue them. That's what they start praying for in Genesis chapter 4. And then you see with, with Abraham and all of the patriarchs and their families, their prayer is always focused on asking God to fulfill his covenant promises with Abraham. From Abraham to Isaac through Jacob, as well, we see the same pattern. For Jacob, prayer is clearly asking God to do what he promised, which often involved protecting him so that the promises to his grandfather Abraham could be fulfilled. So, yeah, yes, there was physical protection and deliverance sometimes from enemies, but the purpose, the goal, the focus, what God had promised he would do. What God promised he would do. So honestly, we could spend the rest of today and maybe all of next week uh, looking at the 
all of the the, uh, things that happen in the Old Testament related to prayer that point this way. Um, I mean, you look at the Exodus and Moses' prayers. Then Joshua and his constant prayers for deliverance were again based on asking God to keep His promises to His people so that His name, as we sung today, His glory, His kingdom might flourish. So it, it was always that as a focus. And finally, we see the prayers of, and this would be a great study, really, the prayers of Hannah, of Solomon, of Hezekiah, of Daniel, of Nehemiah, of Jeremiah, Jeremiah they all echo the same pattern. It's, it's astounding to see how consistent it is, with, and it's with also with the, the very same essential aspect to the call to God in prayer. Ask. Just ask Him. So the focus is, and the goal is, to call upon God to keep His promises, to fulfill His promises. And all we need to do is ask Him and ask Him. Remember the persistent widow? Ask Him and ask Him. He encourages it. Then, of course, there are the Psalms, which are full of Davidic prayers that are, yes, both personal in many ways, but also they continue the pattern. They are kingly prayers, and of course, they're reflective and pointing to the prayers of a king like David, but also the king to come, Jesus Christ. They are kingdom prayers. By the end of the Old Testament, the need to cry out to Yahweh to plead with Him to act is is clear. It's consistent. The book of Chronicles, for example, records ten more prayers than the comparable sections in Kings. In each case, the prayers focus on asking God to do His work in the world, or to maybe express it a little bit differently, especially in our terms for today, which we're now going to look at. The prayers are gospel-focused. They're gospel-focused. So that's point number one. Point number two, Jesus' focus of prayer. So it should be no surprise to anyone that Jesus being the Word of God, being the Son of God, that this pattern continues in the New Testament and with Jesus. For Jesus, and therefore for you and I, for His church, prayer is to be gospel-focused. And based on that, it is simply asking again God the Father to do what He has promised to do. The disciples of Jesus, you know this from reading the Gospels and our time in the Gospel of Luke especially, they saw Jesus making a priority of prayer all the time. Often he'd go off to a hill or to a place off by himself and he would pray. Yes, personally pray. But again, read read his prayers, what his prayers were about. It was about the disciples, but it was about asking his heavenly Father to do his will and, and, and that he would have the strength to do his will and that he would fulfill his promises, specifically related to his kingdom. And so finally, after some time, uh, the disciples finally ask Jesus the important question. They, they, they see him praying, they've seen John the Baptist praying, and they're like, there's something about what, the way they're praying. We haven't seen this, or we've forgotten how to pray like this. We don't know what this is all about. Teach us to pray like you do, and as we've seen John the Baptist pray. So, of course, you know what Jesus taught them, right? You do. It's recorded in Matthew and Luke, but I, I want to show you the passage in Matthew chapter 6 this morning, and we'll focus on that. Jesus said to them, well, here's how you should pray. This is how you should pray. He said this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We've done a study at one point on the Lord's Prayer. And I, I made the point then, and I'll make it again today. Every word that's used here when Jesus directs prayer. Um, Yes, he's speaking to a group, um, 
but he's not teaching them individually to pray, my heavenly Father. He's teaching them to pray collectively. It's our, us, we, consistently in the prayer. So both here and in Luke 11, this prayer is the template, I believe, for prayer in the church and for all of us today. And so as I've already said, the key here is Jesus tells us to pray to our Father. This is a collective prayer. It's whenever we're praying this prayer, whenever we're making a petition to God, asking Him to keep His promises, whether it is for someone's health or our own health, it's to begin the process of praying as if we are praying corporately. We're praying as a church, and yet individually in our prayer time. Jesus tells us to pray to our Father. This is collective. It is praying with and for our church, with the church in mind that Jesus said He would build. It's also personal, of course, friend. It is. And despite, listen, I know this, despite some of our earthly experiences with mere men, earthly fathers who've not been so trustworthy, this is our heavenly Father who is perfect in every way, who can be trusted in every way, who loves you and me just the same way that he loves his son. So a simple but important note about this prayer is, do you see any King James Version style language here, any, any kind of eloquence? I've told the story before, I'll say it again. That I think one of the very first preaching opportunities I was ever given many years ago uh, in Vancouver, I go, it was an evening message, so I wasn't, I wasn't there to be able to preach on the Sunday morning, but I was good enough apparently to be asked to pray in the evening service. And, and I had to go downstairs and pray with the three of the elders, older men, and oh boy, they started to pray, and it was, Thou, Lord, and, and I was like, I was so intimidated. Now, th- these are lovely men. Their prayer life was beautiful, but it did intimidate me. And by the time it got to me and I knew I was supposed to pray, I wasn't really quite sure how to do that. Jesus invites us to pray, please hear this, to our Father, our loving Heavenly Father, in everyday, normal, conversation-like language. Dad, Father, can we talk? This is the approach. Secondly, this prayer, look at how it flows. This prayer is interesting in the way that it flows. We pray that our Father, first, will magnify His name that His name will be made great, and, and that He will be the one who will do that, and yes, use you and I, us, to do that. And then, that He will cause His kingdom to come, which is that He will fulfill His promise to do that, and again, to use us to do that, you know, sometimes I think we, we pray that, cause your kingdom to come. And, and, and we're like, okay, we prayed that, now do it. Not recognizing that's why Jesus has left us here. Because we're called to do that in His strength, of course. So we, he, with the, the, the process is, or the flows, He will cause His kingdom to come, which is that He will fulfill His promise to do that using us, then that His will, not your will, not my will, not any other leader or person's will, be done, but His, his will be done. And where? Where? Here. Here on earth. And when? Daily. When Jesus gave this prayer to them, it's clear here that this is to be a prayer daily. I I want to suggest it's not just daily, but throughout the day is the tense and the understanding is always pray. 1 Thessalonians 3, pray without ceasing is the encouragement that we're given. So once our hearts are appropriately focused on our Father, on His glory, on His will, and His kingdom expansion... Then we ask, yes, look, then we ask, we petition for our daily needs. In that flow and under that prayer request, that first of all, he glorify himself, his name, 
his name be made great, and that he would cause his kingdom to expand in this world. And so again, these are prayers that are asking our Father to do what he's promised to do. So you might be asking yourself, well, well, okay, where did he promise to give us our daily bread? Like, where where did he promise all these things in the New Testament? where, Where would they be? Well, Jesus told us, many times actually. We've already been through it in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 12. We see a really, really good example where Jesus said this in a conclusion statement about various things that he'd been saying about, don't worry, don't be anxious. He said this, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about what? Your life. (laughs) Your life. What you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on, for life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse or barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? To who? Our Father. So he tells us here that we need not worry about anything. Our lives, food, clothing, money. Can, can we just have a, a little confession right now? Do any of us these days worry about our life? <laughs> about food? And about money? He, he, he's asking us to pray, to trust Him, to fulfill His promises that we don't need to be anxious about any of these things. He's got us. I need to pray this daily more and more. He's encouraging us to continue daily in prayer, asking Him to keep His promises, and in doing that, remind ourselves that He fully has us, completely, no matter what. The Lord's Prayer ends with our praying for forgiveness of our sins, repentance, and listen, protection from the real enemy of our souls in this life to this day, the devil himself and his minions. So, confessing our sins to one another. Hmm. How do we do that? I was thinking about that in relation to this, because it's one of the things as part of the four acts of worship and prayer are to happen. What, what is it like? Is it you just walk up to someone, another believer in the church, and say, hey, by the way, I, I feel like I need to confess this, and so, by the way, I did this, and I am truly sorry. Uh, would you pray for me? <laughs> w- would that be h- how we should do it? Wouldn't hurt. would be a good start. But no, when we pray a prayer of confession and repentance, we are to pray it publicly, actually, to one another, And yes, that's plural. Then he is faithful and just to forgive us, sanctify us, where? In his body, in the church. You read Matthew 18 and the the passage where Jesus talks about discipline in the local church. Again, something that we all love. It's supposed to be done in the open. It's never in secret. It's never under the carpet. But sometimes it is in churches, and that's a horrible thing. It's a horrible, horrible thing when that happens. So I wonder, I wonder about us as a church and myself, do you think, what about this? Do you think if we all prayed this way every day that the daily news cycle and the constant rants and posts on social media would have less impact on us? (laughs) And, oh wait, Maybe through prayer, maybe through prayer, this broken, decaying, desperately lost world would experience the breaking out of the kingdom of God in this day and this age. Do you think? That's that's the point. That's why Jesus came, and that's why he's encouraging us to believe that. I mean, do we believe that's possible? That, that we can actually have some kind of an impact that through us, that God can expand his kingdom and, 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 and he can fulfill his promises to restore all things? 
even what we see in our world today? Well, Jesus says that it was. And, and, and he says here in this prayer, and he also gave us this very bold statement. He said this in John 14. Whatever you ask in my name, look at this, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Is it possible for Jesus to lie? It is impossible for Jesus to lie. Therefore, he's telling us the truth here. Now, we must be careful here. We must be careful. We must petition God. We must ask. We must always ask. We must continually ask. But the reality is, and the context here in John 14 makes it clear that Jesus is talking about God's work of opening people's eyes to the gospel. And so if you ask something in my name for a person to know me, to come to faith in me, to trust the gospel, to trust the proclamation and what you share with them, I will answer your prayer. I will answer your prayer. This is what he's praying for. And this is Jesus' focus in prayer. I'm uh, wanting to encourage all of us to, let's be askers, and let's pray in line with the goal of prayer as we pray. Realizing that sometimes, and we all know this, sometimes it's, disheartening when we pray for someone for a long time who's ill, and it appears that our prayer isn't answered, at least in the way we think it should. Well, I have a quote from you from a pastor you all know I love and appreciate, and he said this, Tim Keller, God will either give us what we ask for or Give us what we would have asked for if we knew everything that he knows. It helps us, I think, to understand a little bit more about who our God is. So, thirdly, the goal of prayer. Throughout the Bible, prayer is always seen to be about asking God to do what he's promised. Whether to send Jesus and establish his kingdom or to continue to build the church, of the Lord Jesus Christ until he returns. Essentially, we should pray for God to do his new covenant work through the gospel, which is by his word and through the spirit. This is the goal of prayer. And it is also this. It is the mission that Jesus has sent us on. I think sometimes, we've been over this before, however, we mistakenly assume the goal of the mission is to build the church. Actually, the goal of the, of the mission is the expansion of the kingdom of God, and the church is the vehicle. It's a very important distinction for us to keep in mind going forward in 2021 as we want to learn what we're supposed to be learning from the Holy Spirit about last year and what's been happening in the church. And that's why we've done this series. And so clearly, it's not about, quote, butts and seats but souls in the kingdom of God. That's God's heart, and he wants us to pray about it. So, in conclusion, I want to give you a couple of suggestions, but also this. God commits to answering the prayers of his people who pray like this because these prayers sum up the way of the gospel. That's why we're here. That's why God is still allowing this age to go on is he's inviting people to trust and believe in Jesus Christ and come home. They are all prayers for God to do his new covenant work through his word to accomplish his will and his purposes and promises. So church, may I encourage all of you, all of us, to recommit to a life of prayer and one that is increasingly corporate in prayer. It's a sad Testament. I know you all know this is true, but it is way easier in our day and age to get hundreds, if not thousands, of people to come to some awesome worship experience while church prayer meetings dwindle. There's something wrong here, and there's something wrong in that. And we wonder, we wonder why the kingdom life and the kingdom that we know that God wants for this world to expand in this world, His kingdom, 
isn't breaking out in our community, in our world. Well, we shouldn't. It's a lack of prayer. So as we've been saying for the last four Sundays, I repeat today, our hope is to refocus on what it truly means to be the church. And Rock Church, we must become a more deeply praying church. So my hope and prayer for you and for our church is that we will once again be inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, by the early church's witness, oh man, as we reviewed it, and testimony to be continually devoted, Rock Church, to the apostles' teaching, to the koinonia fellowship, to unity, to oneness, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Commit yourself to these things. Commit to doing that right here, right now, on Sunday mornings. Get into a missional community group and do that corporately in that way. And can I make one final suggestion for you, church, today? I want to leave you with this. Jesus always prayed. We know that. He always encouraged us to pray as well. At one point in his ministry, and we saw it in Luke chapter 10, after previously in another gospel we had seen him weeping over Jerusalem, He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly. The language without ceasing, all the time. The the really deep desire for this. To the Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers into his harvest. Rock Church, Here's an interesting way that we could pray together corporately. I know some of you know about this. It actually started, at least in this way, four or five years ago as part of a C2C church planning meeting up at the executive suites where we were getting together as leaders of our church planning network. And the idea was we wanted to, we wanted to encourage, at least within our network, all of the men and their wives and those who were supporting us to pray every day at 10.02 this prayer. And then the bright idea came up, well, why don't we set our smartphones to let us know at 10.02 every day to pray? Well, it started with a couple dozen of us, and then a few hundred, and then as Gord and some of the other leaders went around the world talking about church planting and giving witness to this, other denominations and churches, at one point, by our best estimate, there were approximately a million pastors and their wives and ministry leaders and supporters of church planters praying around the world at 10.02 in their time zones. But it was praying together. We may not be in the same place, but we're thinking of one another. Can I encourage you, Rock Church, that we do that? I want to suggest to you one thing about this prayer, though, that you need to be really, really mindful of. I was going to say careful, but mindful of. It's kind of subtle, in the way Jesus does this, isn't it? He's asking us to pray to the Lord of the harvest. But the reality is he's, he's asking us to pray that, that God would send laborers into his harvest. And so one of the things we pray when we pray this is that God would send more laborers to the Rock Church, more people to join us. And so listen, if you're part of the Rock Church here today, if you're new with us, you're an answer to prayer. But not an answer to just come and be part of or be in, but to Go into the harvest. Go into the harvest and proclaim salvation in Jesus Christ. Proclaim the word of God. Be brave, be bold, church, in this coming year. I want to encourage you to do that. Let's now close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, our Father, you are in heaven, Lord. You're here with us in your spirit. Lord, we pray together as a church right now, every one of us, we pray that you would magnify your name. We pray, Lord, that you would give us boldness of lips and words and mouths to do that publicly every day of our lives, to proclaim your name. We pray that you would cause your kingdom to break out in our community. Lord, we need you to do this in our community in a desperate and deep way. So Lord, again, I pray for each one of our members of our church family that you would give us boldness. You would give us courage 
You would, you would take away any fear. Help us to go, Lord, into these places and proclaim your word and proclaim your truth. And so, Lord, you've promised these things. And so we ask you, Lord, to keep your promises. And we ask this in faith because we know what we ask in your name, you will. And if it's in your will, you will accomplish it. So, Lord, I pray these things. I pray these for our church, for our church family, for all the churches in this community, Lord, that there would be this kind of unity and boldness in these days. And I pray these things in your worthy name, Jesus. Amen.